Bonjour à tous. Donc pour ce séminaire IAP, nous avons le plaisir de recevoir Xavier Bonfils aujourd'hui. Donc Xavier tra travaille à l'IPAG, l'Institut de Planétologie et d'Astrophysique de Grenoble. Voilà. Donc euh, Xavier est spécialiste dans l'étude, la recherche, la caractérisation des planètes extrasolaires autour des étoiles de type Nen M. Il a fait sa thèse sur ce sujet-là, euh, donc à Grenoble, entre Grenoble et Genève, une co-tutelle entre ces deux instituts. Il a travaillé par la suite à Lisbonne avec Nuno Santos, et puis il est revenu à Grenoble, euh, où il travaille euh, depuis. Donc euh, tu es chargé de recherche au CNRS, si je ne me trompe pas. Il a été il a impliqué dans beaucoup de programmes, notamment un programme ANR qui était euh, dirigé par Alain Le Cavelier ici à l'IAP, donc en collaboration avec Grenoble, sur les atmosphères des exoplanètes. Il, euh, il est, Xavier a obtenu également une ERC qui lui permet de développer son projet euh, dont tu vas parler aujourd'hui, notamment euh, de, donc, qui s'appelle Extra, euh, qui est installé à la CIA. Et donc aujourd'hui, tu vas nous parler donc, euh, des planètes dans la zone habitable autour de ces petites, de ces petites étoiles de type Nanem. Je t'en prie. Thank you, Guillaume. Uh, do you hear me with the microphone? Oh, yeah. Ah. Ça n'a pas l'air. Un, deux. Vous m'entendez Oui, c'est bon. So, thank you for the introduction. And indeed, um, what I want to present is the status of our search for planets around Endorf with a particular focus of, on uh, habitable zone planets, where we are at detecting and um, what's the prospects for detecting and characterizing them. So, few brief slides uh, for context. What are MDOVs? They are stars at the bottom of the main sequence. Uh, they are the dominant stellar population of the galaxy, uh, although none is visible with the naked eye. The, the brightest is just below our sensitivity, but if we were to have infrared sensitivity, we, we would see uh, uh, many, many M dwarfs in the sky. That would be the most frequent stars we see in the sky. They are low mass, they are cool and small compared to uh, FGK stars. They are also intrinsically faint, so harder, in a sense, to observe. The motivation to search for planets around these stars is that we, we see the outcome of planet formation for different initial conditions. The disks, the protoplanetary disks that were around these M dwarfs, we see planet today, uh, they, they were smaller, they were cooler, they were rotating at a different pace, and so detecting different Planets around them helps us to, uh, to know the sensitivity of planet formation to these parameters. The other motivation to search for planets around them is that for many uh, techniques, it's easier to detect planets around them. Because the stars are low mass, lower mass, compared to a sun, it's a factor uh, of typically Uh, 10 to, to, um, uh, to half lower mass, which means that when we do radial velocity, we gain a factor of two uh, in signal uh, or, la or even larger. They, they, they are small, so when we use the transit techniques, uh, we also have a gain. The signal we, we want to measure is deeper, uh, and depending on, on uh, the size of the M dwarf, if it's half the size of the sun or a tenth, then we gain a factor of 4 to 100. Also because they are cooler, the so-called habitable zone, the zone where uh, water could be liquid, um, is uh, closer to the star, which increases the probability to see uh, the planet in transit by a factor 2 to 3. And once we, these planets are detected, they are also easier to characterize for all the same reasons. So this illustrates, sorry, this illustrates that a transit would be deeper around the smaller stars and that the habitable zone is closer. 
And with these motivations in mind, I'm going to present you the observing program we, we have uh, to search these planets with a focus on radial velocity programs and on transit search. So let's first start with RV and in particular a large program uh, we have been doing with HOPS since almost 15 years now that involved all these people from Geneva, Michel Mayer, Christian Perrier, Thierry Forveil, Francesco Pepe, myself, Nuno Santos, François Bouchy, Xavier Delfos, Stéphane Udry, Didier Quelo, Jean-Louis Berthaud, Christophe Lovis, Damien Secrancent, José Manuel Almenara, Nicolas Studillo, Anna Elvuch, um, Felipe Murgas, and Rodrigo Tias. So all these people have been very active and uh, uh, contributed a lot to the results uh, I'm going to show you. What we have been doing with that program uh, well, it has been a very large program uh, on the HAUP spectrograph. Uh, that's one of the largest uh, programs run at ESO. We got uh, 500 nights since uh, 2003. And uh, well, the, the program evolved in the, in the, in the 15 years. We, we started with, uh, with 50 nights of GTO time uh, that were focused uh, on 100 stars. And at the time, we, we didn't know what, uh, what kind of planets uh, we, we, we would find. Uh, there were only uh, one known uh, M-dwarfs with planet when we started. Uh, we detected a few uh, because HOPS uh, gave us the sensitivity to lower mass planets compared to before. And then after this, uh, this first few years, we changed a bit the focus of the program and we, we wanted to look for transiting planets. So transits are rare, so we need to look at many stars. And um, the, the goal was to, to, to screen 300 stars for very short period planets. We were monitoring them for 10 nights and those that were variable in velocities uh, were re-observed. And uh, eventually, we detected planets that we were monitoring with photometry to see if they, uh, were in, if they could be in transit. Now, we, we do something different. We focus on a very small number of stars uh, to look for, to, to do kind of a deep uh, survey for very low mass planets. And we, we are more interested by um, planets that are amenable to characterizations. And in brief, our program detected more than 40 planets from Earth mass to Jupiter mass. Seven of them are located in the habitable zone and are small, super Earth or Earth size. And we also contributed to the detection of uh, transiting planets. And the, those results they are illustrated here. So that's the different uh, uh, diagrams with orbital period versus the minimum mass of our detections. So those, the gray points, are all known planets with uh, measured mass. And the red stars are those detect detected by our survey. You see that we are sampling uh, the low mass regime of planets. Also, if we look at a diagram with distance, we see that they tend to be closer than most detections, the other being around FGK stars. And if we look at stellar radii, of course, they are uh, small, and you see that our program detected actually most of known, star, no, known planets around these very low mass stars. Uh, in the past few years, there has been some uh, uh, very high impact, high visibility results in the field. Notably, you know, the planet detection around uh, Proxima Centauri B, the uh, Proxima Centauri, so the planet is Proxima Centauri B, uh, which is uh, uh, an Earth uh, mass planet um, in the habitable zone of the star. And um, so it, it, has a lot, uh, it generated a lot of interest because there are prospects to characterize this planet rather soon. Uh, our data contributed uh, significantly to that detections, but 
more recently, if I, I want to highlight just a few of our detection, and, and I, I choose another one, which is uh, ROS 128B. Uh, it's also uh, an Earth's uh, mass planet, uh, possibly in the habitable zone of, uh, of the star. And uh, it's the second uh, known in distance. Uh, and the advantage compared to the one known around Proxima is that this star is very quiet. Uh, Proxima is known to be a flare star. Uh, and uh, some uh, uh, works have asked that actually the flares are powerful enough to uh, uh, completely evaporate the atmosphere. So focusing on more quiet stars uh, leaves maybe more hope to de detect an atmosphere or uh, to, um, to even uh, search for biomarker in this atmosphere. And this prospect, like for Proxima, Proxima for that star, uh, this, is, uh, th this could be possible in the ELT era. So there has been some simulations done for Proxima um, the, the, the methods to, to, to detect the planet would be to combine high angular resolution, adaptive optics, with high spectral resolution. So you would resolve the, the, the planet thanks to the high angular resolution, but not quite detect it. Uh, with Adaptive optics alone, it would be with coronography alone, it would still be buried in noise. But to boost the signal at this location, you can cross correlate the spectra you record for each pixel with a template, and then you can recover a planet compared to the noise around. This, this, is, a, so this is an illustration of the methods. This is a simulation done for for planets similar to Proxima Centauri b. It was actually done before the detection of Proxima Centauri b. And uh, you see, you, will detect, you, you do detect the planets, and actually here the cross-correlation is done with oxygen lines, which means you would detect oxygen on the, in the atmosphere. And actually, the, the signal-to-noise co calculations are very comparable for um, ROS 128, it's just a bit closer to the star. It's, it would be 15 milliseconds away. Um, and while there is some hope to already do that detections with the VLT, it's been proposed by Lovis et al. Uh, well, as, as soon as you have planets closer in, you, you would need the ELT to do this. Okay, so that. Uh, I've shown you some uh, uh, some results for our radial velocity program, and I, I'm going to continue with the with the transit search. So transits, they are the, the motivation to do transit is that first, when you well, it gives you access to the radius of the planet, and um, and it uh, leaves some degeneracy in the structure of the planet. For instance, here. Um, there are two planets that are one Earth mass, but they have slightly different radii because one is, uh, is made of, with a lot of water and the other is rocky. So measuring precisely both mass and radius can uh, uh, tell us what's the bulk structure, or help us infer what's the bulk structure of these planets. Uh, this is the light curve. Uh, with the time shown in a circular way, uh, in the fashion of an orbit. And if you can add spectroscopic resolution, then the small uh, change in transit depth uh, can reveal a small change in planetary size that that would be due to the atmosphere that filters uh, light at some wavelength uh, and not at others. So doing light cues as a function of wavelength, you can actually build a spectrum, a spectrum of radii measurements across wavelengths. 
And this is one that was done for WASP31, and where you can see many features and il that illustrates well what can be done with these techniques. For instance, you have a signature here of relay scattering that points that that is interpreted as the presence of haze. You have the detection of several species, sodium, potassium, and now I think you even have uh, TIO in recent observations. Not sure it's for that planet. Here, uh, it's interpreted as water detections, and the fact that the measurements um, are at this level, not below, is, it's because you would have clouds. Uh, complementary data on, on other systems have also detected winds or made maps of exoplanets. So there is, there is a, a, a wealth of uh, physical information to get from transit data. For, for MDOS, uh, how those uh, transits are, are detected? Well, MDOS, they are intrinsically faint, so if you want to take the brightest, you have to look at them in the whole sky. You cannot do that with a, with a large field of view. So uh, yeah. a few years ago, almost 10 years ago, Dave Charbonneau proposed to look at them with small telescope, but individually. Not many stars, at, uh, just one M-dwarf per, per, per telescope. And uh, eventually, each telescope is assigned a, a, a set of 10 stars to look at during the night, and they, they cycle on, on that set of stars. And if there is a, a signal compatible with the transit, it, it, it can trigger an alarm and stop on, the star, on that star to confirm the drop in flux and eventually do a preliminary detection of transit. Um, with our HAP survey, we, we contributed each time they, they had a detection, we, we contributed by, by doing the mass measurements, which is a confirmation of the planetary nature of the planets and also help to, to understand the structure. We measured a few and I choose uh, one example. It's um, LHS 1140b and uh, it's a six Earth mass planet uh, that is also located in the habitable zone uh, of its star, 15 parsec away. And here it's a, another diagram, it's similar to the one I showed before. Um, so here it's planetary radius instead of mass, with a zoom in for very small planets, um, versus mass, versus insulation, stellar radii, or distance. And you see that that detection was particularly close uh, around the very small stars, so with deep uh, transit um, depth. Uh, it falls in the habitable zone and uh, it was found to be particularly dense. Actually, we continued monitoring the star. We did a uh, huge observ observing campaign. So it, wa it was at the it, it, when detected, it, it, was, um, uh, it was also at the time where the the target selection was being done for GWST, and it's one of the top priority targets for, uh, for characterization with uh, GWST. And um, <coughs> so we did a, a huge campaign with radial velocity to, to, to refine the mass of this planet, and actually we detected another planet with three days. And a similar intensive campaign was being done in photometry, and with Spitzer, uh, wh while doing the observations to refine the radius of the planet B, uh, the MERS group detected the planet uh, here. So actually, uh, this also detection illustrates a nice strategy to find planets you, you, you wouldn't find otherwise. That you, you, you don't have the sensitivity with the small telescope, you will not have the sensitivity with the radial velocity survey, um, uh, in the, when you look at many stars, but once you have detected a planet, you start characterizing the, it, and, and the intense observations uh, gain sensitivity to much smaller planets, her size. 
And uh, so this one also would be, will be very interesting to look at with uh, James Webb. One, that, one detection that is not of, uh, from our survey, but that is uh, uh, very high profile in the field, of course. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the, it's the TRAPPIST detections. So uh, like those I've shown, these are around uh, small stars, even cooler than the sample we, we have been looking at. And uh, here are the light cubes of the initial detections of uh, the first uh, three planets detected in the system. And doing complementary observations with uh, Spitzer, uh, they revealed uh, an amazing system of seven planets. They all have uh, characteristic um, uh, like uh, Earth or even Mars. Uh, and uh, the, um, so this is the system to scale with um, our solar system and uh, with Jupiter. Um, and li likely one or maybe three or maybe more planets are in the so-called habitable zone. And because the star, because the, the whole star is very small, uh, the, there is this big advantage for planet characterization. Um, so this is a, a diagram with uh, all planet detections in transit as a function of uh, their equilibrium temperature. And this is a metric uh, to that measure how easy it is to measure, to detect the atmosphere for the planet. And you see it's uh, really at the top. Uh, only GJ1214b, a detection with the MERS survey uh, and, uh, and our ARPS data, is uh, easier, but it's a larger planet. Among the whole size planets, it's really the, the easiest. And it was actually done right away with, uh, with HST. Uh, this is a, a spectra of uh, well, an attempt to detect the atmosphere. The signature, so the variation of the transit depth, excuse me. The variation of the transit depth with wavelength would have been that large if the, the planets um, were uh, with an atmosphere made uh, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me made with um, helium and hydrogen the fact that the signal measure is much flatter means that this scenario is ruled out and it can be made of water or clouds so there are still many composition or no atmosphere uh, that are not ruled out. But an atmosphere made of hydrogen and helium is now ruled out with HST observations. Actually, those are the transit, those are the spectrum for planet B and planet C. And this one is a combined spectrum when both planets were seen in transit at the same time. <coughs> and what you tend to see is actually you have a reverse signature of the water band. And um, uh, yeah, no, it's H2, but it would be water as well. And uh, th this uh, is actually um, a concern for very low mass stars. <coughs> I'm afraid it's not going away, sorry. Uh, it's actually a concern because those stars are so cool that you actually have water in the atmosphere of the star itself. And um, so when you have a transit, if, the, if that water is not spread uh, in a perfectly homogeneous way on the stellar disk, then your occultation uh, will, uh, will mask some of the water, but in an uneven way, and you might find this signature in your uh, atmosphere spectrum. 
And uh, this can be a very big concern for GWST. There are, uh, uh, so that's the top priority for GWST. But GWST does not have very high resolution and, uh, and it might find, uh, uh, it might measure more the star than the planet. So the, there is a, the possibility to uh, still to, ev even if, if this is the dominant signal, there are strategies to mitigate this. It's to look for the transmission spectrum, but at much higher resolution. Um, here it's shown for Spiru, the simulation that shows the transit depth um, as a function of wavelength. And because Spiru is much higher resolution, 70,000, the signal is also much higher. You, here it's in parts per million, and you have thousands per, per million, so it's uh, many, uh, it's thousands. And of course, for each spectral channel, it's uh, very noisy, but at the end, you have reached out all the signal to, to do the detection. And actually, so you, you measure a light curve for each of the spectral channel, and you end up with a lot of noise, but you can cross-correlate that noise with some templates. That's what I've done here with a template with a, of a planet of an atmosphere that would be made of H2, the one that is ruled out uh, with uh, HST observations, but still it would be detected very nicely. Uh, and <coughs> the, the one in yellow, I don't remember, it's a denser atmosphere, and the one in blue is, uh, is water. This would be done with just one transit, two hours observ of observations. And compared to the low resolution, there is one, uh, well, you still have the possibility to see the signature of the star rather than the planet. <coughs> but the, at high resolution, during a transit, Sorry, it's not going away. Yeah, the break of the <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So, during the transit, there is a change of velocity of the planets of a few kilometers per second. And a few kilometers per second is a few resolution elements for Spiro. So you would see, you, you, you hope to see this cross-correlation profile to shift during the transit. <coughs> there are also prospects to search for oxygen, but you need much larger apertures than the CFHT. For instance, here it was uh, discussed with the ELT and it, there is no signal-to-noise calculation, but it's just to show that the transit of an Earth-sized planet in front of a M dwarf would create a signature of that much. Uh, So the, 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 the strength of the signal is that much. Uh, and this is one, uh, uh, this is uh, the strength of CO line for Tobu. And those has been detected with the VLT. So when you see that strength and you know it has been detected, uh, it's on the same scale, uh, you can think that uh, uh, there is a great chance we, we do have the precision to detect such a signal. Of course, Tobu is a very bright star. <laughs> uh, Tobu is a very bright star, and Dwarf is very faint. 
So you do, lead, you do need the, the ELT aperture to do these kind of observations. <coughs> OK, so I've talked. Uh, uh, I've shown some very interesting um, individual detections. I want to, to say a word about statistics that we, we also gain insight at detecting many planets. It's just, it's not just a, a competition to find the most habitable planets. It's also we, we can bring constraints um, on, on the model. So that's uh, statistical studies we have been doing with, um, it's a bit dated now. We are, we are in the process of updating it with the PhD students in Grenoble at the moment. But here were the detections a few years ago with a sensitivity map. This is the number of stars uh, with enough measurements to, to, to have the sensitivity to a particular planet in either mass or period. So for instance, we, all our samples were sensitive to giant planets uh, at uh, uh, a few hundred uh, days periods, but actually in the Earth's mass domain, we get sensitivity uh, for only a handful of stars. So given the number we have detected and an evaluation of that sensitivity, we can compute some frequency of occurrence. And here in that study, we, we did show that there, there was actually a great number of planets in, uh, around M dwarfs in the low mass regime. And if I do that not in, with periods, but with insulation, I can have a proxy for the habitable zone and derive the occurrence rate for Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. Okay, uh, this was also done with many studies uh, with the, on the Kepler data, where, which detected a uh, few uh, uh, M dwarfs, uh, uh, a, a number of planets around early type M dwarfs, and they also get some uh, large number for the occurrence rate of small planets around these stars. Actually, it's also a bit dated, but that's at some point it was the list of studies that looked at the occurrence rates of planets in the habitable zone. All get quite large number was first low by dressing a Charbonneau, but then revised to a much higher number. And those are all for transit survey and our from uh, radial velocity survey. Another important insight uh, comes from the mass radius relationship. So we can, we can combine both transit and radial velocity. <coughs> um, So, oh, let me skip, sorry. The most recent studies are those two by, Van, by um, Fulton and, and Van Halen. And they show that the distribution of planet size uh, is kind of bimodal with a separation around 1.8 uh, Earth radii. Uh, those stars, um, given the mass measurement, those stars are believed to have a, a, an, a large gaseous envelope, whereas those stars are rather rocky. And these uh, bimodal distributions, that's, that valley might correlate with orbital periods. It needs to be uh, confirmed. But this is a, an important uh, result because it means that if you want to focus on a planet for, for the habitability perspective, for the, to, to find life at the end, to, to search for biomarkers, you really need planets that are smaller than 1.8, 1.5 Earth radii. The two Earth radii won't be a truly habitable planet because with a too large atmosphere, the pressure at the surface is too high to have liquid water. <coughs> Excuse me. Is it 
understand what's the origin of the um, so it can be reproduced by models. Um, I, I'm not showing that, so the question is welcome now. Um, it, it, there are um, planet synthesis models. So they, they take all the ingredients, I believe, uh, the ingredients of planet formations and run Monte Carlo simulations with uh, planetary embryos that grows in a disk. In the, and uh, there is a competition between um, uh, migration of the planets, uh, gas evaporation, and at the end, you observe the population of planets you have that you compare with our detection. And, uh, <coughs> and they do form a valley between rocky planets and uh, larger planets. So it's believed to be the result of that competition in the formation process. We, we have been looking at that as well in mass and or, well, we were not expecting many planets here, but it seems that below a certain mass, they are also, well, sorry. So th those are different curves that correspond to many rocky earth structure and water planets. So density curves and below a certain mass, all the planets we detect tends to be rocky. So it's also true in mass. What's the prospect for detecting more? Well, there is TESS that's flying at the moment. TESS is the successor of Kepler. It's doing the, the survey for the world sky. Uh, it it, it observes a patch of the sky that are 90 degrees in height and 24 in width, and change fields every 27 days. And change hemisphere, uh, that, that's the first year, and the second year is on the other side. And um, so that, that's the coverage you expect. The, the, there have been simulations for the yields in terms of planet detections, many planets. Um, thousands, so those are false positives, thousands, even tens of thousands giant planets, few tens of uh, size planets. If you look, uh, they are going to be around much brighter stars than those detected by Kepler, so of great interest for uh, further characterization. And here, is a diagram of those detections as a function of the hostile temperature. So the M dwarfs are here. So many are going to be around M dwarfs. And as a function of insulation, this is a very relaxed definition of the habitable zone. So it's probably uh, less than that, around one. Uh, and actually, in their prediction, they would not detect small planets uh, smaller than 1.5 Earth radii in the habitable zone, or maybe they expect one detection, two, and those remain uh, simulations, presumably a bit optimistic. So the, the, the strategy we, we need to have to detect planets with uh, an interest to, to look for biomarkers that won't be detected by tests is one that we, we have seen for a few examples. Uh, I, I, I think the most efficient is going to be to follow up on test detection, which already are, has a planet. And well, it's known from different studies that uh, in the small mass regime, planetary system has a low uh, scatter of inclinations. They tend to be coplanar. So when you know there is a planet, there is a high chance of detecting another one. Uh, there has been actually a study to quantify this, and they expect that uh, hundreds of planets are going to be missed by tests, and that um, and, and uh, that can be detected with a with a survey, uh, like ground-based survey with a sensitivity to these size planets from the ground. 
even if uh, you don't have a huge completeness in terms of period from the ground, you would detect many of them. That's precisely what we want to do with, uh, and what other wants to do, that's what Trappist or the, the, uh, the Speculos uh, project, which is uh, Trappist version 2, is going to do. And that's what I want to do with EXTRA. And EXTRA is a, is a particular project. I got um, an ERC grant to develop this. And it aims to, to change well, how we do uh, photometry from the ground by adding spectral resolution. Um, so maybe I need to speed up a bit. But, um, so usually you record image, you measure the flux of your star, and you uh, calibrate your flux with some comparison star. What we want to do, what we are doing, is to uh, add spectral resolution. Why do we want to do that? Uh, to observe, well, one motivation is to observe in the infrared. If you were to want infrared with small telescope, it's hugely expensive. To equip Trappist with an infrared camera would cost about half a million. Uh, so it's not really possible. And the other reason is that we, if we have spectral resolution, we can have a very broad bands. And if in, the, in between we have water bands, we can filter them out uh, in the signal analysis. So they don't add noise to the measurements. And uh, we can use more flux uh, to make those measurements. Okay, I, I show more data, detail later how we are going to, to do uh, that. So there is a huge team, all based in Grenoble, to, uh, to do that project. This is a sketch of the project. Uh, so telescopes in their own dome. And what we do to, to do spectroscopy is that we change, we remove the camera you usually have at the focal plane and we put a robot to position fiber. So we go multi-object. So those are arms that move and to place a fiber at the tip of the arms in a focal plane here. And those fibers for all three telescopes are rooted underground and goes in a room here with a small spectrograph. So it's multi-object and it's multi-aperture. Since we rearrange the focal plane, we can have a very small detector, and, we, and then we can afford to have uh, an infrared detector. It costs just 100,000 euros, just, but it's one for three telescopes. So that's the strategy we wanted to develop to go to the infrared. The difficult, so difficulty is that you, have to, you need a very precise centering, otherwise you have differential error in your aperture. That's our design. And we, well, yeah, th this one, that's the tip of each arm. We have different aperture. And because we need to center very precisely our star inside an aperture, <coughs> we have added a bundle of fiber to pre-image the star before each scientific exposure. We did lab measurements to demonstrate it was possible to do differential photometry with fibers. So with our lab measurements, we have shown um, photometric precision relative between two fibers of the order of 10 to the minus 4 or below. And it changes with temperature, but at a level that is uh, much better than what was used to do uh, from the ground. Okay, let's keep that. Um, and where we are now, it's all built. Uh, it's in La Silla in Chile. Uh, we have our telescopes in each dome, all equipped with uh, the robots, the fiber positioner. Uh, and uh, it's all functional. Actually, we got first light uh, about a year ago with one telescope. The other were not working, they were installed, but not working without the robot. And this year, we, we have been uh, working with uh, many commissioning runs to install the other two telescopes. <coughs> uh, 
and uh, to uh, <coughs> to correct uh, the well, we, we have done some correction all along the uh, during the year. Uh, when uh, when I accepted the seminar about six months ago, uh, I thought I would show you great results, but we are not really at that point yet. We are about to start. We just have some results that that shows that it's going to work. Yeah. So that, that's uh, a star I observe uh, during a few hours and uh, without any transit. And uh, if we bin the data, we show we have submitting magnitudes uh, in just a seven minute bin. So any longer bins show that we have better the precision than many magnitudes. And this was a transit. Uh, it was a large planet, but the, the, the transit of an Earth-like planet would be just twice smaller than that one. So easily detectable. And we have identified uh, some source of noise that we, we, we are correcting at the moment uh, to, to largely improve uh, these measurements. So we, we are going to, to, to start operations soon to do that strategy. Follow up on test targets and search for the planet test does not have the sensitivity to detect. And we are going to do that along other with other instruments as well. Uh, infrared spectrographs such as NIPS, um, the infrared harm of HAPS, and SPIRU at the CFHT. And uh, similar strategy in photometry uh, uh, will be done, but uh, on a one object, object per object basis with KIPS. To conclude, well, I, I, so I tried to, to report on the status of that search for planets around very low mass stars. Um, so we have had many detections. We, in the past few years, we are really in the, in the temperate uh, exo-Earth regime uh, with uh, very many high-profile detections, such as Proxima b or ROS 128b. And we have few others that are almost as close, and that will be amenable to characterization with DLT. Also, fantastic detections, not by our group, but that's really a, a huge detection from in the field with TRAPPIST and kind of similar one with 1140. We gain uh, some insights already on, the, on what, 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 what kind of planet we should focus on for, uh, to, 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 to characterize habitable planets. And we know uh, it, it has to be planets smaller than 1.8, 1.5 Earth's radii. Uh, we, we are the, at the moment of a new revolution with the, with the test missions, but it won't find those planets. We need also experiments. It's going to be plateau in few years from now, but meanwhile, it, it can be a ground-based survey like uh, the one we are doing with Extra, Hobbes, Peru, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Xavier. Maybe you have just a little voice to answer some questions, or if there are comments, they are welcome also. Free comments. Tom, yes? Uh, the B model uh, distribution of uh, radius, do you interpret that as planet with and without hydrogen, yeah. or another uh, interpretation? Yeah, yeah. So the, the envelope would be hydrogen helium around this planet. Okay, and you have, do you have a check with the mass to check the density of those yeah, that are too far yeah. away or so not? So I've been too fast on the first study that pointed toward this, uh, this bimodality, that's that one. So there has been two, Weiss and Marcy and Rogers. So one, so that's radius as a function. This is a kind of, uh, it's another metric. That's the probability of being rocky. Probability of being rocky as a function of radii. And you see above 1.8, you don't, there is known as the probability of being rocky. And there is a transition and below 1.5, there are likely rocky planets. And here, it's another one so that's radius versus 
which is density, so there is mass. Uh, uh, well, for all of them, that's the same planets, but two different studies. And you also have a transition around 1.5 Earth radii. Uh, Other question? Yes. You have shown the O2 uh, prospect for detection for O2. Uh, how many lines at which wavelengths? Uh, yeah. How so many lines yeah. do you have to make the correlation? So there are two. Uh, um, there are two bands at 0.7 something microns and one at 0.2 microns. There are studies to 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 compare both. Uh, <coughs> I'm not sure it's obvious which one is uh, better than the other. <coughs> um, how many lines? Um, I can. Sorry? Two lines? No, no, you need many lines, yeah. To, to boost, to, to do the cross correlation and boost the signal. So, yeah, 0 0.76. And the other, you, are, you have another band with uh, uh, less. Uh, no, I, I, you have another band at 1.2 micron. micron. I, I don't remember which one is better. Uh, maybe Anna knows better. And uh, well, you have that many lines to for O2. For O2, yeah. O2 is uh, is that one. You have two bands like this. Okay, maybe your last one. Thank you. About the, the, the atmospheres where, we, where you would uh, presumably have hydrogen and helium, uh, is, isn't there a problem of, of, of these uh, light gases staying in, in the, on the star given the small mass of, of, the, of the planets and the proximity to the star? Would yeah, you yeah, think that they so would be evaporated very quickly or something like that? Um, because these stars are very old. I mean, uh, yes, what yes. is the, the, the age of... It's, it's not really expected <coughs> to have this. That's just they are the first model we can test. But I think, but then maybe Alan knows better, but you, you, we can imagine to find small planet with hydrogen uh, helium envelope if uh, there are remnants of a larger planet that has been evaporated. So mm -hmm. that but what, what, what would be the age of these, of these stars? Several billion years, I would say. Yeah, ma many are billions uh, years old. But uh, I mean, although you have evaporation, so you don't, you, presumably you don't evaporate all the planets. Uh, mm -hmm. And at the end, if you start with the giant planets, you can still have uh, some, co some core. At the, yeah, so. At the, and then they would I, eventually I disappear completely. <laughs> It's, it's a paradox. You, you look for habitable planets, and you you are speaking of a shrinking planet that will eventually disappear. Not very comfortable to live on these planets. Are, <laughs> if it turns out we, we we identify one with a helium uh, hydrogen envelope, of course, uh, it's uh, of no interest anymore for habitability. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. If there is no more questions. Okay, okay, and thanks again, Xavier. Bye.